I want you to imagine that your eye has a zoom lens. Imagine that right here on the side of your head is a dial that you can turn to zoom in or zoom out. Please, reach up right now and grasp the dial firmly. I promise you, it won't hurt. <laughs> now, all together, slowly, turn the dial forward. As we do, the big picture of the room around us fades away. But the payoff is you can see the smallest details of one tiny part of space, the red D up here on the stage. Keep following along, keep turning that dial, and something amazing will happen. The curvature of the D straightens out. The D has expanded to become something like an infinite red prairie. We're standing on the edge of it. Got the picture? If you do, congratulations. You now understand calculus. <laughs> the word calculus is just mathematicians' jargon for the idea that reality, some parts of reality, become simple if we look at them at a really tiny scale. But of course, there's two different ways to play that scale-changing game. Start turning the knob back again, but this time, let's not stop at the normal setting. As you zoom out further, it's as though you're becoming gigantic, rising up above the room, above the Earth. Penn State's <laughs> campus comes into view. Then the whole town, the long ridges of the Appalachians, the Great Plains, and then, once again, curvature, the edge of the Earth. Around it, stars twinkle and the sun blazes. Keep turning the dial till you're at the moon's orbit. Only the Apollo astronauts have seen with their own eyes what you see now. Our Earth, our home, not as a limitless prairie, but as a small blue marble floating in the vastness of space. Things have become simple, yeah, but in a different way. The prairie and the marble, two different pictures of our world, both of them capturing something important, both of them simplifications. Which of them is more relevant at this moment of history? In the prairie model, we see the world as huge and ourselves as too small to affect it significantly. In the marble picture, we see the world as finite and ourselves as big enough to impact it for good or for ill. Hold on to that picture now. And come with me to Oxford. In the spring of 1991, in the North Oxford Health Center, a group of nervous young men have gathered. We're there at that antenatal class because we're all soon to become first-time dads. I wish I could tell you all the good things we learned. But to be honest, there's only one thing which sticks in my mind all these years later. That moment when the midwife leading the class said to us, you know, if the baby kept growing throughout the pregnancy at the same rate that it grows in the first trimester, then at birth, it would weigh six million tons. Yes, 
During those first few hectic weeks, the baby is swimming in what seems like an infinite sea of resources. The prairie model applies, and the baby responds by consuming those resources and growing. Exponential growth, mathematicians call it, doubling in size every week or so at first, one gram, two, four, eight. But way before the baby reaches six million tons, in fact, before it reaches 600 grams, the growth curve begins to straighten out. The limits of the prairie model are becoming apparent. Mathematicians have a special name for that straightening out point. We call it the point of inflection. As with the baby in the womb, so with humanity on Earth. There are many ways to measure our impact on this planet. And all of them, or nearly all of them, have been growing exponentially since the time of the Industrial Revolution, with a doubling time of about 40 years. Indeed, we've gotten so used to this process that we've come to think of it as normal, as something that will last forever. But endless growth on a finite planet is neither normal nor possible. The question we should be asking is, how near is the point of inflection? Are we still in the realm of the prairie model, where the overriding imperative is to consume and grow? Or are we coming into the realm of the mar blue marble model? where the imperative is to steward and conserve. Well, there's some evidence that the point of inflection may be near. In a large-scale survey appearing in the journal Science earlier this year, the authors undertake to delimit a safe operating space for humanity, a space within which we can continue to thrive by comparing humanity's impact to the Earth's capacity on nine different scales. Think of them, if you like, as nine gauges on Earth's control panel. The results of the survey are sobering. Of the nine gauges, two are in the red danger zone, two more are in the yellow warning zone, and only five are green. To put it simply, it looks as though the young people of this generation, the kids in my class tomorrow, are the ones who are going to have to embrace this fundamental shift from the prairie to the marble, from consume to conserve. What tools will they need, these young people? What tools will you need to surf the waves off the point of inflection? I can think of two, a cool head and a warm heart. You'll need a cool head, and to a math professor, that means math. When we talk about sustainability, we're talking math. Sustainable means it lasts. Math asks, how long? When we talk about environmental change, we're talking math. Math asks, how fast? When we talk about risk, math asks, what are the chances? When we talk about ecology, about the interconnected web of life, math asks, how connected? Yeah, you guessed it. Mathematicians have figured out a way to measure that as well.
numbers fly about in these discussions. You'll need the cool head to make sense of them, to put them in context. Math is a vital tool, I believe, as we face an uncertain future. But a cool head won't be enough by itself. You'll also need a warm heart. You'll need a love for this place, this blue marble from whose stuff we have been made and on which we have been set to dwell. Here, hold out your hand. Imagine right now I am placing the blue marble in your hand. Take a close look. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? And it's your home and mine. And it's home to seven billion other people as well. Don't fantasize about escaping it for some alternative habitat. There is no planet B. There is no a way where your garbage goes. There is no somewhere else where the coal is mined. There is only Earth. It's only our beautiful home. Home which you are now holding in your hand, in the hands of the coming generation. Let's love it. Thank you very much.